The first part of our, of our session is going to be quite similar to the session that we had on Quizlet. So if, um, if you joined us for that session, you might hear a lot of what, the same thing again. Or if you maybe watch this video, then you can skip through the first little bit and get onto the tool itself. Now, specifically what we're looking at today is the second part in our view of digital assessment. What are we referring to when we're talking about digital assessment? Now, when we looked at Quizlet, we looked at consolidating content, and now we're looking at formative assessment in quizzes. Now, it's very important that we understand where we are coming from when we talk about formative assessment as opposed to summative assessment. So, first and foremost, we're going to discuss the difference between these two, what formative assessment is and what summative assessment is. Now, formative assessment, I often view it as being very much a student-centered thing because it's a slightly different approach. While both formative and summative assessment is student is, is obviously a student-focused thing, and both of these are, are also teacher-focused things, in a way, formative assessment is more linked to the student and the progress of the student. Whereas summative assessment, as we said, I feel that the teacher plays a more significant role in this instance. Now, in a simple way of describing it, formative assessment is what we often look call assessment for learning. In other words, we use it to try and determine the level of our learners to understand their mastery of content knowledge and to try and improve it. Right? In other words, we use the assessment as a tool to guide our learning practice so that we know this is an area that I need to focus on, this is an area where the learners are okay. That, that idea is something that we need to look at when we have formative assessment. Summative assessment is essentially what we get at the end when we do assessment of learning. In other words, we check whether or not the learners have in fact learned. Now, one of the big problems that we've had in the past and still have, is that any form of assessment is usually quite time consuming. If it involves the, if it's going to involve the, um, the teacher who has to now go and mark and give feedback, etc., etc., it's a time consuming process. And because of that, we've often found ourselves in a position where we are stuck doing mostly summative assessment and not nearly enough formative assessment. So, the tool that we want to look at today and the tool we looked at on, on Tuesday, both of these tools are designed to give us a greater insight into the learner. Or The one tool was a specifically in support of the learner, and this one that we're looking at today, quizzes, is to give the teacher a better view of, the, of how the learner is progressing. So the great thing about the position we find ourselves in now is it, with formative assessment, a lot of it can be automated now. So in other words, it does not require a teacher to sit with a red pen and to add up marks and to check memos, etc., etc. It does not require them to do that. Um, they can, in fact, set up a, a digital thing that does the heavy lifting for them. All they need to do then afterwards is go and have a look at the marks and do a quick assessment of the marks whether it's on a personal level, an individual learner trying to figure out where this learner's um, shortcomings are, or whether it's an entire class approach to realize this is an area where the entire class is struggling. It, how, you, how you go as a teacher and use the information that you collect is entirely up to you. Um, summative assessment, for the most part, is not going to change dramatically with, um, with, with the advent of digitization. Now, there are elements of it that will definitely, that can definitely change, and there are elements of it that will, over time, change. I see um, our, uh, some of our assessment team have also joined this session. So, with summative assessment, it is a changing thing. It's a, it is a slowly changing thing because of the nature of summative assessment being a formal assessment happening at the end of when learning has taken place. So in this instance, in summative assessment instance, for my part at least, I feel that the teacher still needs to play a very important role in being actively part of the whole marking process, etc. Whereas with the um, formative assessment, we can now let other programs do this heavy lifting for us. It allows us 
to engage our learners on, uh, it allows us to engage our learners a lot more. Now, one thing that I think we sometimes get a little bit, um, where we get bogged down when it comes to formative assessment versus summative assessment, formative assessment does not have to be a mini summative assessment in the sense that I always use the example um, from my experience coming from um, from a background as an English high school teacher. My learners had to write 450 word essays on topics in novels. Now, in order for them to be able to do that, I gave them 20, 30, 40 um, question, multiple choice, um, multiple choice quizzes that they had to complete. The two seemingly completely disconnected but if you're able to answer all the questions accurately on 40 multiple choice questions, it shows that you have knowledge of the content. And at the end of the day, that's what the summative assessment is going to be about, testing your content knowledge. So the two need not look the same in order to achieve the same thing. So that is a very important snag that people get stuck with. They feel that, look, we don't answer, we don't have multiple choice questions in our tests. It's not something we have. We don't have true or false questions. I understand that. That doesn't mean that a summative, that your formative assessment has to mimic your summative assessment. If you can get over that point, you're going to make a big progress towards using formative assessment effectively. The soup analogy, I think, is a great way of understanding and describing the difference between the two. So, in the soup analogy, we're going to look at the assessment is, uh, or the, the content knowledge is the soup. So the chef is essentially the learner. Formative assessment is when the chef tastes the soup and makes adjustments. So in other words, if the chef wants to be able to produce the best possible soup, he needs to be able to taste it as he's going along. You, you, you can go with your gut feel, you can go with your intuition, as what happens when a learner says, I think I know the work well enough to go write the test, but they might be wrong and they might end up in a situation where it doesn't go as well. Whereas when we get to the end, summative assessment is when the diner actually tastes the soup. So in order, for, to, in order to have the best possible dining experience, the chef has to spend time to make sure that the soup is, 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 is the way that he wants it to be. And the same applies to content knowledge. When a learner learns something, it is important for them to go through a process to determine whether they actually know it before they're being assessed on it. And I think this is a big shortcoming that we have at times, is that learners, we, we are so focused on summative assessment that we don't have time to get to the formative assessment part of things. Now, what ends up happening is we have something that I like to refer to as the broken feedback loop. When feedback happens, when learning happens, we always start with a basic concept of content knowledge that needs to be built. So this is where the teacher plays a vital role. The teacher builds the content knowledge. Then the teacher must assess the content knowledge to determine whether or not the learner actually learned the knowledge. Now, this assessment can either be formative or summative. Ideally, we don't want the first level of assessment to be a summative assessment. And then what happens is feedback on assessed knowledge. So once I have, once, once I've given the assessment to the learner, the learner completes the assessment, and I can now provide feedback on the content knowledge to essentially guide them and support them in whatever happens. Now, the problem is there's a vital step that is missing here at the top of the feedback loop. And we're going to get to a more complete feedback loop in a, uh, um, in a minute or two. Just something that I, I didn't quite discuss um, on Tuesday that I think is important to understand. When we talk about assessing content knowledge, one of the most common practices in terms of formative assessment is the task of assigning homework. Because we teach our learners something and then we give them homework. And the whole point of the homework is to determine whether or not they actually understand what they've been taught. Now, the problem with that homework um, and it might be different in different in different phases and different bands, but very often the problem with our homework is we we can't be that involved in the process of going through whether or not they got it right or got it wrong. So the learner does the work, but they don't actually get the feedback. Yes, we mark homework in class, but that doesn't always isn't always 
um, accurate enough to give the learner the, the, the feedback that they require. Now, let's go back to the chef quickly. If we look at a chef, how a, chef work, a chef's feedback loop works is quite simple. The chef adds the ingredients. This is like building the content on You add the stuff that's needed for the soup. Then you taste the ingredients, which is essentially like assessing the soup that you have created so far. Then, very importantly, he determines what is missing from the soup in order to improve it. And then he adds more ingredients to correct what he, whatever he has done so far with his soup. And only when he is happy does he get to the point where we go, where we send it to the diner and the diner will then assess whether or not he, like, he or she likes the soup. So in this, yes, there are three elements here um, to, that mimics the loop, but the, the, the bottom line is the chef is doing something similar to what we are doing when we are building content knowledge. The only difference is a good chef will taste the ingredients. A bad chef will just send it out hoping that it's all good. Now, when we look at a complete feedback loop, what we're actually looking for is the idea that content knowledge has been built, it has been assessed, and feedback has been provided. And very importantly, we need to identify the missing knowledge. We need to determine what they know and what they don't know, and then continue to build the content knowledge. Now, importantly, if you look at the feedback loop, I deliberately placed an image of the teacher and the learner here in the middle. Because when we, looked, when we look at something like Quizlet, Quizlet's idea is very much to actively engage our learners, to turn them into active participants in learning and not just simply passive. Because Quizlet's big, um, big drawback is the fact that you that it's difficult to actually get um, information in terms of the progress that they've made um, from those quizlets. It's a learner-driven thing, very, very much so. The teacher sets it up and the learner drives the learning. So incredibly useful in that sense. But we need to have information um, that we can use from a teaching side to also determine how we're going to approach teaching, remember? We call it assessment for learning. So in other words, this kind of assessment needs to instruct our own teaching practice that we understand this is an area that needs more work. This is an area where we feel we are okay. We've covered the work already. Um, so the, the teacher and the learner are both very important when it comes to the feedback loop in the sense that the learner can also identify missing knowledge just the same way that the teacher can identify missing knowledge. So let's look quickly at how Quizzes does this a little bit differently from the tools that we have looked at already. And we're almost getting to the end of our theoretical part, and then we're going to dive into the, the functionality of the app. So it's a teacher, oh, I forgot to change the spelling, sorry. It's a teacher-centered approach. Quizzes is an online quizzing tool designed to test the learner's content knowledge. That's the idea behind it. It's quite straightforward. Um, Anyone who's used something like Google Quiz or Google Forms, there's lots of different tools out there that does the same thing. We're just going to look at one or two of the little add-ons that Quizzes has that, that makes it, in my opinion, quite a nice tool to use. And this, I think, for a teach, from a teacher side of things, is probably one of the nicest parts of the Quizzes tool, is the teleport question function. What it means is you can search a vast database and quickly generate a quiz from pre-existing questions and answers. You can also find a quiz and you can just copy it and modify it in any way that you want to. And all of it's just there and available. Now, when you set up your own quiz, you have the option to make your quizzes um, unlisted or private at least. That means that anyone who has the direct link to it can get to it, but people won't discover it and it won't be added to the teleport question function. But as something and I always try and promote is the idea of if you are going to use others' quizzes, if you're going to teleport questions from their quizzes, then it's just a nice thing to be to be willing to add your stuff to the vast database as well. But I promise you, using this, you can set up a 50 more quiz in no time. It is incredibly quick and incredibly easy to do. Then something else that is a vital part of quizzes that we don't have in something like Quizlet is the fact that you can create a classroom or, and this is where it gets very powerful, you can link it to your Google Classroom. So if you've got a Google Classroom up and running, 
you can create a you can create your um, quizzes classroom and link it to your Google classroom in other words when you are posting quizzes they will get notifications through Google classroom which is makes it a lot easier to keep up and you can also track learner progress of the multiple quizzes we're going to talk about how the whole Google classroom work link works when we get to the to the application itself and then the last thing about it that, that, that works very well is you can actually assign a quiz as homework, which means there's a due date and there's lots of little um, settings that you, can, that you can have for this. Or you can use it in a live mode, which is a kind of gamification um, way of doing it. It's, we're going to look at a live mode in a minute um, just so you can see what that actually looks like. It's a very, it's a very nice way of engaging your learners in class. The live mode so um, similar to something like a Kahoot that many people I always look at Kahoot is almost the granddaddy of the, the formative assessment tools um, similar to something like a Kahoot only it's a little bit different in that it's not as chaotic as a Kahoot session would be um, and then and then sorry you can also share the live practice mode we're going to talk about it in the learner centered part as well I see there we've got the spelling right Quizzes allows a learner to test his own knowledge of content. If answered as a homework assignment, a teacher can track the progress and support if needed. So when a homework assignment is assigned, then the teacher will see what's going on. But very importantly, the learner will also see what's going on. When I assign quizzes, what I quite often like to do is give them multiple opportunities to answer the quiz itself. because. Just in that, you can already get a sense of who the learners are that are already trying to improve if they took the opportunity to improve their mark. Um, because that also it teaches you something valuable about the learners in your class. So I quite like, uh, when I say quizzes, I quite like the idea of, um, if you see my, If you click on um, Kim Lee, if you click on the change layout option, I'm not sure where you do it on the mobile device exactly, but there should be a change layout. You'll see there are, if you go to the people, you'll notice that my name will appear there twice. One of them will say presentation or something like that. You just need to click on that and click on the pin icon. And then you should get back to the presentation. I'm just going to quickly start up the presentation again because I see some people are having the same issue. Um. Right. I hope you see the presentation now again. Great. Right. So what also what I also quite like is the ability to use the practice link. So the practice link means that the results will not be captured. So for sometimes learners are a little bit worried when they're going to just go through a quiz and everyone's going or not everyone. The teacher will see what they did. So the practice link is a nice alternative to the homework assignment. If you're just going to, especially, let's say for argument's sake, we're making a hyperdoc where we've got lots of content on, on a specific subject, and then at the end you want to have, you want you insert the quizzes, but you use the practice link rather, so that it's something that no one needs to capture the data. It's literally a case of read through content and then just check if you understood the content. Um, so this is a very, I, I generally speaking, really use this use this function a lot when i created hyperdocs and created um things that i'm not too bothered whether or not what what i don't need to see what the learner does but the learner needs to just check if they understood the work so for that this works very well and something else that works that, that, that's great for the learner is there's a lot of elements of gamification involved the kids really enjoy this because they are things like memes and power-ups and you'll see the live mode there's engaging music etc et there's a lot of little things bells and whistles um one of the great improvements of quizzes that they've made and from the time when i used to use it in class is they've also given you the option to turn off almost all of those bells and whistles and make it a much more formal straight 
um, assessment. So if you want to have all the bells and whistles, which the kids enjoy, it's great to add them, but it's also sometimes you want to just formalize things a little bit and remove those things. But you'll see now, I, I think I added, or to be honest, with the live mode, I removed in quite a lot of the gamification tools now because I want us to move through it a little bit quicker. Um, if we have time, we'll, we'll look at one or two of those things as well. And then the other thing that is interesting about the whole quizzes thing, learners will also have the opportunity to go and create their own quizzes. Or they can go and search the database to find quizzes. And they can create quizzes and they can share it with their friends. I know this happened once or twice where some of my more industrious learners went ahead and created their own quizzes and sent it to each, to each other. And they tried to see who can set up the most challenging one and things like that. So, um, and this is not a common thing that happens, but more, the more you get your learners to be actively active participants in the learning, they'll do things like that, which is actually quite fun to see. Now, with that said, the, the, the first thing that I want us to do now is we are going to, um, oh, where did I put this thing now? Right, we're gonna actually play our first quizzes. So, what you'll see in front of you now is essentially the the joining screen of quizzes. So uh, the email that I sent you, I asked you to, um, if possible, download the, the quizzes app on your phone. There you'll see the game code, 202266. If you're worried that you're gonna lose the presentation, it's okay if you, if you can't um, do it, but it's great if you can. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to um, give you a copy or copy the link to the, to this thing straight into the meter in the chat. You'll see there's the, I've just pasted the link to the live game. So you can click on that link and it'll take you to a join quizzes, join the quizzes mode. As soon as people have joined, it's going to tell me that people are joining the game. We're waiting for the players to join the game. Right, while you are joining this game, let me just quickly say something that, that um, in terms of how we're going to structure the rest of the session. Um, because we are doing a session that is technically um, categorized as a slightly more involved. Oh, by the way, if you join the session, you'll, I don't think you'll be able to select your own name. I, I set it up that it gives you a random name, but when you set your sessions, you can define, decide whether or not you want to do it that way. So, um, this session, at the end of the session or during the session, I'm going to also share a, a Google form with you in which you can complete, um, where you complete a few um, questions that just shows the evidence of learning that has taken place. The idea behind that is it gives us an indication of who has gone through quizzes training and not only listened to the presentation but tried to apply one or two of the things you don't need to actually um you don't need to actually do it now necessarily you can do it at a later stage as well are there no brave souls that are going to join the session right Okay, so there are actually quite a few people in already. So we're going to start now. And this thing probably just needs to refresh again. All right, just give me a second to refresh. Right, okay, there we see. I see a lot of people on the game. So. Right, so you'll hear there's a lot of music going on. I'm just going to turn off the music because it sounds a little bit strange. And you'll see a number of questions. There aren't many questions. I think it's about 10 questions. So um, just to see if you were paying attention, let's see how it goes. Right, and again, I've hidden your names so that we don't see what you're saying. So, so as you can see, what's happening now is there's a live leaderboard. What I like about this, as I said, if you compare it to something like um, 
and Kahoot, it's not quite as crazy in terms of, of, of the, everyone's just trying to tap as fast as they can. You can, in fact, set it so that time is not a factor in terms of the, the points that are awarded, which means that the learners spend a little bit more time, but they quite like the fact that they're able to see what's going on, who is doing well, who's struggling. I see I've moved up now. I'm just guessing random answers. And we can see that Wheat Woo, whoever that is, is doing quite well. There's also things like the hot streaks and the um, that people go on, which gives them extra marks. Right, and as you, I think some of you might have the sound activated on your side, on your mobile devices. If you're in a classroom, it sounds a bit weird now because I'm playing it, because I'm presenting this. But in a classroom, you can add the music again. It's all part of learner engagement. Anywhere that, that, that learners can be engaged in the, the learning activity. Right, so I see some people, Capsicum Cottontail, the first one to have finished the assessment. But again, uh, what's nice about quizzes is it doesn't award speed as much as some of the others awarded. Because what happens, I've seen learners sometimes just hit the button as quickly as possible just to try and and be faster than the others. But this one, slow and steady wins the race. Let's see if Carrot Cottontail can... Uh, oh, it's already at the top. This is going to win. Is anyone going to... No. Right. Okay, so we're going to end this game quite soon. Just so we can move on, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave it open for now, so you can finish. You can finish your game if you want to. Um, but now we're going to move over to how we actually create these quizzes. So as you can see, it's quite an engaging tool already. I've already got a sense that um, Carrot Cottontail, whoever that was, paid attention, got almost everything right. Um, what's also nice is I can go into the question specifically and have a look at where people struggled. So the assessment, this assessment is sometimes called an assessment of learning. Um, a lot of us got it right, some of us got it wrong. Here we've got the true or false questions, always a popular one for people to get right. So you can go into this as a class and determine how they did as a class. So if you're doing this in the live mode, that's what, why they have added this option of giving the, the, the random character, the random names because learners don't always want their names to appear on the board for their learners to scrutinize or for their peers to scrutinize them. So this hides it quite nicely, but if you, the more you do it, the more comfortable learners will become with it. What I just suggest is you obviously gonna have the leaderboard, don't scroll to the bottom and show everyone that poor Mint Mowgli has only answered one question and got it wrong. So as you can see, there are still some people that are answering questions. Very nice way of seeing what's going on. A tool for tracking. So this is the gamification mode of it. But now we're going to go back into how we actually go and set up one of these things. Um, every possible way of creating a quizzes is, is, is fundamentally the same in the sense that you first have to set up your quiz. So that's the first thing that we're going to do. Um, in order to get to quizzes the address um, the address is very straightforward and simple I'm just going to paste the address over here you don't need to open it yet you can just for now um, look at the or, or follow the presentation but setting up one of these quizzes is is or, or logging let's first talk about that how you actually get into quizzes like many of the digital tools out there you can use a Google account you just simply go on there and you say, um, sign up and then you click on sign up with Google. This makes it easier for you to just have things syncing across all the different devices. I've generally speaking, if, if something gives me the option to sign up with Google, I like to use that option. Um, it just makes makes it easier for me then I don't have thousands of passwords and little um, usernames to remember. But it's personal preference. You don't have to do it that way. Now, in order to create our first quizzes, it is as 
simple as clicking on the create button you can either click there or there it'll do exactly the same thing the left on the left pane is your navigation that you're going to use a lot um, but here at the top there's only a simple function that we want to use and that is create our game so it'll take you into your game into your creator we're going to just call this example quiz and then it asks you to choose the subject that you want to choose there's more so there's a whole bunch of options and then if you don't find what you're looking for you can always select other we're doing professional development this time so we're going to select professional development and it takes me to the quiz generator now you've got five options and the one thing about quizzes that's also um, I suppose one of the really nice features about it is they as far as I know I might be I, I might stand corrected but it's all free there's not a there's not a, a paid for version um, that you get extra features. So there aren't buttons you're going to click on. It's going to set, ask you to pay money now. Um, all of it, all of it's going to actually be accessible to you. So the default one that we use all the time is the multiple choice option. So if we click on multiple choice, it brings me to this little dialog box where I create the question. So we're just going to call it um, "What color is the sun?" as a question. Now you'll see here on the right hand side, I think this is a very clear indication of the intention of the designers of this of this tool. This is what it will display like on a mobile device because that's when it works at its at its prime, when learners have a mobile device, a cell phone, whatever it is. And similar to um, the tools that we've discussed so far, if they've got the app installed on their phone, this takes a minimal amount of data to actually run but still learners always going to moan about data usage. So what color is the sun? We're going to say it's blue, it's um, brown, it's purple, or it's yellow. Simple as that. I've entered my, op my options. You can choose multiple correct options, but you just need to tick one that you're going to select is correct. And we're going to select yellow is the correct option. If you want to, you can add, there is a math equation editor. I not coming from a math background i can't tell you if it's a good math equation editor i just know that it is there so as a maths teacher if that's something that you are interested in you'll have to go and explore it and see if it works for you because i know um there are things i look at it and i think oh this looks fine and then other math teachers will tell you look there's a lot of functionality that's not built into it so go explore it and see if it works for you something that they've added quite recently that's quite that that is very nice You've got the option of adding images um, to your to the top to the question. So either drag and drop an image, upload it there, or enter a URL. Right. So um, for the most part, with these things, usually pasting a link to an image is one of the easiest ways of doing it. So you can just simply go to Google, search for uh, search for something, go to images and get copy the URL of the image. So if you right click on the image, copy URL, you'll get that and you can paste it in here. So um, we're just going to look, I'm going to, let me show you quickly how we do that. So here I am in Google, I've searched for sun. I'm just going to click on images. It'll take me to a whole bunch of images of the sun. If I want to use an image, be careful. If you're going to right click here, you often don't get the actual thing that you want, you first need to click on it so that it displays on this side. Once it displays over there, now we can right click and we can say copy image address. That means you've now got the URL and we can go back to our quizzes and all that we do is we paste that link in here and it instantly finds the image for us. And we say save. So now it's going to add a little image of the sun and it and I asked the question what color is the sun it's a bit of a dead giveaway if I'm gonna give them that image with these questions but I think you get the idea if you realize oh wait I don't want that in there and this is a feature that is a new feature that I think might be very useful for for um, in certain instances but that is the ability to record audio so I can actually ask the question What color is the sun? And I stop it and I just play back. What, what color is, is the, the sun? sun? Right, so it sounds a bit weird now because I'm already using my mic somewhere else. 
Um, it's a bit pitchy, but it normally records fine. And we save that. And what's great now is it's been added to my question. So they can read the question, what color is the sun? But you can also what read color the, is the sun? sun? Right, so there, that sounds a bit better. Um, so you can add the audio to it. Remember, when you add audio, this naturally bumps up the data usage quite significantly. Once I've done that, save, and my question is done. I've created my first question. The same applies. I'm not going to go to, into every single mode, but you've got multiple choice. You've got check boxes. You've got fill in the blank, a poll question, which is an unmarked question, and open-ended, which is also an unmarked question. So if you are looking specifically for, um, let's just do the fill in the blank quickly. If you're going to, if you want, want them to fill in specific words, so we're going to say, um, uh, let's use the same, what color is the sun, question mark. Then when you add answers, just be careful, and I haven't tested this in detail yet, but... Whenever you have a fill in the word, you need to give them options. So in other words, you can have it capitalized, lowercase, and then we're going to have in all caps. All right, don't know. It, doesn't, it says um, case sensitive doesn't matter. So it doesn't actually, it's not going to bother too much with that. What you might need to look at is just adding spaces and things like that. Um, or if you're going to accept that they give the Afrikaans answer to it, then you might need to add that. So you can give them multiple options just to make sure that they actually get it right if they are correct. And then we save it. And the last thing that I want to show you as well, that um, that's quite a, a nifty thing that one can do, you can have use images. So we can say which one is the sun. And we'll add our image of the sun save and we'll just um we can just add another image in there let me just quickly grab another image um for us to use right so we can add this question sorry now i used a wrong option There we go. So now I've added those, those questions. Just remember when you add an option or when you create the multiple choice, the default thing is it's going to give you four options. If you don't want four options, all that you do is you just remove the option. So now I've only got two options. Which one is the sun? And you show them two pictures and they need to just select it based on the image. Very nice little um, tool, I think, especially useful for your, for your foundation phase and your... Um, and your, your intermediate phase. And I'm sure this is applications in high school as well. But let's select the right answer. What I want to show you here as well, one of the significant advantages that this tool has over some of the others is when you look at the time allotted to answer this question, the default time is always 30 seconds, but it can go all the way up to 15 minutes. So if you're going to give them a complicated maths equation that they need to solve, as an example, and multiple choice, there's four options, but you realize this is going to take them a while to get to the answer, then you can give them a whole 15 minutes to try and answer this question. Um, I haven't used that specifically, but I know, I know some people use the 15 minutes application when they get to the, when they get to the longer questions. Now, Probably the most exciting part of this tool, what I'll is is the teleport function. For me, this is really what sets it apart from other from other um, options that you've got out there. And I know other things have this as well. But if you click on teleport, what happens is it searches all the quizzes that have been created. Right now, Kim Lee, you do not label the images. What happens is the images appear on the screen and they literally tap the image that is the correct one. So the images are clickable or clickable. If you want to label the images, what you're going to have to do, and this is a lot more work, you can download those images and then open it up in an image editor and literally add the A or the B. So you don't label the images, it uses the images as the interactive um, button itself. If you want to add the text to it, it is something you could do. It's a lot of effort though. Right, so 
when we get to um, to this point, teleport, what happens with teleport is you'll see by default it goes and searches for the title of the quiz. Now, let's say we want to, for example, import something on, um, what do we want to do? Something on Macbeth. Right, so now we're going to just search for Macbeth. So it'll find a whole bunch of quizzes based on Macbeth. Now you need to, you can be a little bit more detailed in your questions here, but if we pick, if we select a quiz, what happens is it shows us the questions. And all that you can do is you can click add and add. So as you read through this, you decide which are the questions that you like, which are the ones that you want to use, add those questions, add those questions, and then add this one. And now we're happy. We've added enough questions from this. Let's go to the next one. Now we're going to add. Okay, I'm not reading through any of these questions. And can you see how quickly I'm now building a, a, a comprehensive, or how quickly I can build a very detailed quiz based on questions that have already been asked. Now, the nice thing is once I've added these questions, I can very easily go, see, I've got 10 questions already. I can now go edit the question if I want to. So if I'm not happy with anything here, or let's say I just want to add narration to all of my questions as an option for the learners. So then I just go there, audio. Um, then read the question now. In the beginning of the play, Macbeth is the general in a war with which country? Right, so there we go. In, in the, the beginning, beginning of the play, okay, I'm not going to play that again. So now I've added narration to it. I've literally taken the question and added it and added the narration to it. Let's say this is something that is going to be an important element for my learners. I can do that with all the questions. I can edit them in any way that I want to. And using that teleport function, you can put together quizzes in absolutely no time, Get put, putting them together. And because you can edit all the questions, and you can select which questions you want to use. A lot of, I know a lot of, um, of other tools allow you to take an entire quiz. But quizzes' whole mentality, as far as I understand, is they want you to read the question and the answers before just putting everything in there so that, you are, that, that, that there's, more, there's, there's more of an element of quality assurance that's happening. Now, um, all right, so we are done with our quiz. Now we're going to just finish up with this. The last few things that we want to do. When you create your quiz, you can decide whether or not you want to make this public or private. Now, as I said in the beginning, I'm going to encourage people to create public quizzes rather so that it becomes part of the, of the entire database that people can use. But you are more than welcome to rather say, I'm going to make this thing private. In this instance, because this quiz is not really useful for anyone out there, I'm going to make this one a private quiz. I don't want everyone to have access to this quiz. Now, you'll see it says quiz quality scores because I've got a few things that I need to keep in mind if I want to have a 10 out of 10 quiz. It's quite an easy target to hit. I've got a name for it, and I've added at least four questions. Now, they also want you to add your grades. You can do it. There, there, there are different ways. You can click on this add grades if you want to. But if you say done, it's going to ask you to add grades anyway. And then lastly, if you want to, you can add a quiz image, which we do the same way that I showed you how we import an image. You go and grab a URL of an image, and you just use it as your quiz image. So I'm going to say we are done. And we're going to leave that. It tells me I can add the image. I've selected the language. So if you are going to set up a quiz in a different language, for example, Afrikaans, you can select that it's Afrikaans. This just makes it slightly different in terms of how people discover um, discover the, the, the whole thing. Okay, right, let's just leave it at Afrikaans. And then grades, I think you can actually now save it without defining any grade. So we're gonna do that. I oh, know it, it asks me I have to define a grade. So I'm just gonna scroll down to the bottom and call it professional development, which means that it, it's technically now labeled as grade 14. Whatever that means, you'll see it says 14th grade which essentially means that it's not part of the rest of the, of the quizzes yet. Now, now I've got my quiz. 
The next thing, the last thing I want to show you, because now we're going to pause for a minute as well to give you time to ask questions and to, in fact, go and create a quiz before we go on to the next, the, the next bit. But what I want to show you here quickly is what we can also do is if we search for a quiz and they to let's search in public library, we're going to search for, um, I don't know why we're stuck with Shakespeare today, but let's search for Othello. Why not? Right. So there's a couple of filters that you can apply here as well. That's why we label things in a certain way. So let's say we're going to change this to Afrikaans. We might not want to actually because, no, wait, that's not going to work. Well, let's say we're going to make it Afrikaans. We're not going to find anything Othello Afrikaans. Let's search for Verskinder. All right, so there you go. There's a couple of math things that, that's already been set up. We can also say we're going to, we only want to have a look at high school maths things. So there's only two ones that we've set up for high school maths. Um, if we go to elementary, there's a few more things, 45 results. So again, this is part of why we want people to start contributing to this public, um, to the public space. Because as you can see, the minute we go away from English, and the minute that we want South African specific content, we don't have a lot of options out there. That's why we need to start being the ones that are adding on, that are the ones that are adding content. Um, so if you have a look at this, there's a number of different questions. You see there's a little preview almost that it shows you over there. Now let's say for argument's sake, we're gonna go into this one, um, which I imagine they created as a, let's find one that's actually been Right, so this one's been played a few times at least. Um, let's click on it. It says second to 12th grade, which feels a little bit unlikely. But if you find a quiz that you like, yeah, we've got Ufol Huke et Driuk, da 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 da, those basic questions. Now, the minute that I open up someone else's quiz, you can use this one. You can use the play live, you can assign homework, you can practice, you can save it, etc. But what you can also do, if you find an entire quiz that you like, except you want to add an image there as an example. If you simply click on edit, what it does is it creates a copy of this that you can now essentially make your own and use any way that you want. So in that sense, it's very straightforward to create a quiz, but it's also very straightforward to use one that already exists. Now, the next thing that I want us to, to look at, right, is I'm going to give you a minute or two. Well, it's going to be more than a minute or two. Let's go. I'm going to give you about um, five to ten minutes now to go onto quizzes and to go and create your own quiz. Right now, once you've created your quiz, make sure that you don't, or you can just create it so long. Then I'm going to also share a link with you, and this one this becomes a little bit more complicated. You don't have to do that now, but I'm going to share this link with you. If you click on this link, it'll take you to a quiz that I have already created. I'm going to show you that quiz. Um, we just want to say down here. I'm going to show you the quiz quickly. Right. So the quiz one is called Quizzes Create Your Own. When you open this up, you'll see there's a couple of things here. Please replace the answer options with your details, name, surname, school. And then you'll see question two. There's a little bin icon that you need to remove. You need to remove this bin icon. You need to just read the questions and then change this last one to an open-ended question. If you, I'm going to give you a few minutes to try and firstly create your own quiz. Secondly, to try and modify this one. That I've um, that I've shared with you, and then once you've done that, just leave those two quizzes in your library. We're going to add those links to a to a um, Google form at a later stage, just to show evidence of of learning. So this is the moment where you need to go and fiddle around with it, try to make it work. And if you can't get it to work, this is now obviously the opportune moment to ask the question. How do I do this? How do I do that? I'm struggling with this, etc.
So if you're done with that, if you're busy with quizzes, just kind of continue with quizzes, do your thing there. Um, if you're finished with that, you're more than welcome to go onto this Mentimeter. There's instructions there at the top where you enter an address with a certain code. I'd love to see what your feedback is regarding this. All right, there you go, Eric. There's the attendance register. Right, I think as I said, I'm going to give us basically until half past. Because this has now been the longest part of the session. The last bit that we're going to look at after we're done with this is just how we then, once we have our quiz, share it and get learners onto our quiz. Because that's obviously the, the other important part. But if, if you are done with your Quizlets, both creating your own one, please don't go and create an exhaustive one. Just a few questions just so that you get an idea of how it works. Just give me a thumbs up in the chat screen. Right, I'm sure those of you who have finished it by now would have noticed it's a pretty quick process to create these quizzes.
Right, we need to start getting to the point where we're going to move on. Otherwise, we might not get through everything that we want to get through. Right, so I see some of us are, getting, are finishing up now. Don't worry if you haven't finished it yet. Just don't close tabs and things. I am going to send you an email with all of the information and the things that you need to, to still get. Um, also, if you haven't had time to add to the Mentimeter, don't worry. We're going to get to that in a minute or at the end of the session if we still have time. Right, so we're going to dive back into quizzes now. So if you are on another tab, just make sure that you navigate back to the meet again to the presentation okay right so what i have now is i've now created a library of content that i can use now you'll see there's a bunch of other things that i've created in the past as well but never mind that we're going to look at these that we've created so i've got my example quiz i've got this viscander quiz i've got this create your own one the formative and summative one that we just played now, if I want to assign a quiz, so let's go to the example quiz and, and use this as an example. If I click on example quiz, it gives me four or gives me three options of assigning it, essentially. We can do the live mode, which is the one that we did when we um, just after the, the, the theoretical part, the played live quiz. Now, that works very well when learners are in your class, with a mobile device, you've got a whiteboard, you put that on the whiteboard and they are there answering questions. Or they're doing it, if, or if you're in a computer lab, same story. They're at the, at the uh, a device, but the learners need to have a device that they can do this. And it's a live thing, so we want to kind of do it simultaneously. Alternatively, it actually works quite well in a presentation like this, that what we've done now. Because you are sitting um, somewhere else remotely, you're answering questions, I can put up the screen and we can see how everyone's doing. Um, the other option, and this is something that I suppose one uses a lot, is the assign homework option. Now, if we click on play live, just to discuss, to show quickly how this works, when we use play live, it goes into by default the classic mode. Now, I'm not going to even discuss the other two modes, we're just going to focus on the classic because that's where you're going to start. The rest is straightforward enough for you to be able to figure out on your own. Now, when I have this live mode, any kind of mode, the, the live mode and the homework mode look very similar um, in terms of assigning it. So I can choose to assign it to a class. We'll discuss the classes in a minute. Um, and then if I want to go into the advanced settings, I can or I don't need to. I think it's important that you just have a look at the advanced settings because this is going to be um, an important thing with with regards to how you're going to end up using this in your classroom. So the, some of the settings to take note of here, the general settings, you can set how many times a student can take the quiz. Whether it's homework, whether it's live, it doesn't matter. You can decide. If you want to give them the option of doing it three times, then you can do that. The minute you do that, however, the minute it's locked in this way, they must sign in with an account. So in other words, when they sign in with the account, they also do it with a Google account, or they can create their own quizzes account. So when you do this the first time, when you're kind of getting to terms with it, it's not a bad idea to just set it to unlimited, just to kind of get a feel for it, because the learners will have to have accounts that access this, which again works very well once you've got a Google Classroom set up. Now, the name factory is the thing that we use where it generates a random name for them. This works well with a live mode, but for homework, you don't want to set it on. You will probably want to set it off and you will tell them into your own name so that I can see who you are who completed the work. Otherwise, we don't know who all these random people are. Then show answers in game. So this isn't this. This is about a technical thing that you can decide whether or not you want them to immediately know 
when they answer a question, um, what the correct answer is, they will know if they were wrong either way. But if you say show answers in game, it'll show them this was supposed to be the right answer. Um, so you can decide how you want to use this show answers post game. Again, when you set when you when you have that set up, then they will see all the answers. So typically, if I can show you how I used to use this, I often set mine to three. And this is now for the homework assignment, and then I would switch these things off, which means that when you answer it, sorry, I think on no no, no on on means that they actually see as they're answering the question whether it's right or wrong. So I often left it like this. And then show answers post game off, which means that they get the opportunity to answer the quiz. They see how they did. They maybe they got 10 out of 20 and they realize, look, I need to try this thing again. Then they go back and they go through the material again and they answer the question, the quiz again. By the third time, ideally, we want them to get close to full marks because the idea of this is to pick up the gaps in their knowledge because that is a very difficult thing for learners is they if you don't know that you don't know the content, then you will never actually, if that makes sense. They, they, they don't know the content well enough to necessarily understand that there are gaps in their knowledge. Um, the Dunning-Kruger effect, essentially. But that, that is, a, is, 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 a, is what this is for. It allows the learner to identify gaps in their own knowledge and then go, oh, go and do it again a second time. But if you want to, and you want to say, look, no, they're only going to get to do it once. We want to see that they do the work the first time. Then that's the mode that you can use. Um, right. So then when you get to the gameplay settings, here are all the cool little gamification elements to this. The power-ups means every now and then they get to choose a random power-up, which gives them bonus points. It can be detrimental to their teammates. It can be positive for the entire group. All sorts of fun little things. Works very well in live mode. I wouldn't necessarily use it in other modes, but very cool for live mode. Then you can shuffle the leaderboard. You can show, um, sorry, shuffle the questions, shuffle the answers. You've got this redemption question um, feature that you can activate, which means at the end, once they've answered all the questions, they get to retry one question that they missed. And then the memes is a big part of the quizzes thing. Um, that I didn't activate now, but I highly suggest you go and have a look at them. The memes are quite fun as well. All of that are based on, on, um, on just getting the learners involved. Now, this, as we said, is the live mode. Once you've picked all of those things, once you're happy with those settings, it remembers your settings, by the way. When you run a new one, it will remember the settings that you set up the last time so that it's going to be the same. Uh, we just want to change this to unlimited to just make that a little bit easier. Then it takes me to this screen. Now, this is the live screen that we saw earlier um, just to give you a sense of how that one works. So we want to end the game. We don't actually want to play the live version now. Assign homework looks exactly the same. All of it is the same. Um, it's got a whole bunch of things ticked on now. Some things have been switched off. You can, again, you can fiddle around with these settings as much as you want. It's the same settings. The only difference is now you've got a learner should complete the quiz by and you assign a due date for this. So this is not a live mode. So when I once I've assigned my due date, it's one day and seven minutes from now. Then I say continue. And now it's a little bit different in that they can do it the exact same way. They go to join my quiz and they enter a code and then they'll start running with this thing or you can send a link to them. So if we click on this um, link icon, it immediately gives copies the link to my, um, to my clipboard and I can just paste it anywhere that I want to. Um, I haven't assigned it to a, class, to a class specifically, so it won't show me a list of people that are supposed to do it, but if I assign it to a class, it would. You can also Google Classroom. Again, um, Quizzes loves integrating with Google Classroom and he does it quite well. It's going to do essentially the same thing. If I click on Classroom, um, share a link, and I click on Google Classroom, it'll just find my Google Classrooms that I have. It, it knows this based on the setup that I've already done, and I can just select whichever class I want. If I click on that one, it'll just paste that link to, straight to that Google Classroom. It's also, I think, quite useful to be able to do these things. Assignment title, assignment description, it just gives them a little bit more information about 
what is going on and what it is. You can also schedule this thing if you want to. If you want to set up a homework assignment today, which starts tomorrow and is due for the day after that, you can do that as well. Fiddle around with the settings um, to find the way that you want to want to use it. Then, of course, if you are not interested in, in, in running this thing anymore, you can just simply say end game and it'll just stop the quiz dead. Um, you don't need to move on with it now. So the last mode that I want to show you, so I know we're going a little bit back and forth now, is the practice link. Now the practice link, um, what the practice link, what's nice about the practice link is it doesn't have a due date. It's not a live mode. It's essentially looks like a homework mode with and it automatically has unlimited tries. It doesn't record a name, anything like that. This, as I said, for me, works very well when you're going to create a hyperdoc with different content on it. I know someone mentioned in, on, in the, the, the Mentimeter creating interactive PowerPoints. Now, if you're going to create a PowerPoint that a learner, a self-navigated PowerPoint, as an example, where the learner goes to the content on his own, it's great to add this practice link mode at the end of the thing where they can basically say, test your knowledge, and then they go into this quizzes and they answer the questions without any worry that it's going to go and that someone else is going to see how they did. Because I think sometimes sometimes that, that fear of failure um, prevents the learners from even trying to determine their own, their own success. So the share practice link. These are the three modes that you can use. The live play, a homework, and the practice link. Now, there's one other way that you can also share it, but to be completely honest, it's a way that I you, you won't use it with your learners, but you can have this option where you say share with instructors. Now, share with instructors, essentially what that does is it creates a link that will bring them to this exact same screen where they can then make a copy of it, where they can then play live, assign homework. So this is something if you're going to set up one quiz that needs to be used for all the different classrooms, then you're going to do this. Then you will definitely share your quiz. So you can enter an email address here. You can copy the URL, but to be completely honest, you can literally copy the, the actual URL at the top as well. You don't even need to use this share with instructors. It's quite easy and straightforward in how it does this. The very last thing I want to show you quickly in terms of this before we get to the classes as well is the print function. Now, the print function is actually quite a quite a nifty little tool um, if you want hard copies of a quiz. If you want to put together a quiz very quickly, you want to make a hard copy of it. Um, what I found works best is if you're going to go down to font size 13, it tends to it tends to to make the the, the use the space as best it can because it is going to be quite big. Question image size, you can select that there is no question image. And we also, um, the option image size is going to be a little bit larger. I see the audio thing is still in there, so they haven't. Remember, the audio recording is very new. I saw it today for the first time. Um, so I think they're still probably working on that. And then you've got the different things that you can. So if you want them to be, want it to be something that they write out, that you don't give them the options, you can remove the options completely. Then it becomes a written test. Um, you can add an answer key at the bottom if you want to hand it out to them, they answer it, they can check their own answers. Or maybe you're just going to print out one, one with an answer key and then you're going to leave, um, print out an additional copy without it. So this is quite, is quite nice if you want to be able to put together a very, very quick multiple choice um, quiz hard copy. And then you just simply go to print. You can print it as a PDF that saves it onto your drive. You can print it, go straight through a printer, actually, anywhere that you want. So um, if you need a hard copy, it's a very cool tool for creating a hard copy. Now, before we get to the classes, the reports, just to show you quickly what the reports look like. This is actually quite a bit that we, but I'm going to focus on the important bits now. So here I can click on, this is the live game that we just played, the formative and summative assessment. So when the session is done, when everything's said and done, you can go into the report. Now, every event and every session that you create, creates a report. 
which will be displayed like this. And you can come back to it at a later stage as well if you wanted to. So here we've got all the different people who attempted it. We can see um, some of you entered names, some of you logged in, and it actually captures the name of the person that completed it. Remember, it didn't show it. Um, it didn't show show the name um, when we had the live game. But for example, here Leon Young logged in, so we can see that he what that he completed this. Now I'm not going to go into the email par email parents thing because this is quite a quite a cool little feature that it has. But you can once you've got classroom set up, you can attach a an, you can attach a parent email address to the learners, and then you can click on email all parents, and they will receive a report of the quiz that the learner completed. So if you're going to do a formal assessment, let's say you do something um, at the end of the term, which is like a preparation for the big final test, then you can send an email to the parents so that they've got an indication of where their learners are in terms of the, the, um, in terms of the content knowledge. Just to give you a very quick overview, I, I printed this one as an example. So they will get a, an email that essentially shows this to them. Um, the questions, the correct, incorrect, how, what the questions were, how long they took. I'll get an email with all of this information on it. So if you really want to get your, your, your parents heavily involved in what's going on, it's, I think there's a lot of value in using a tool like this. But it can get a little bit of an annoyance if you're going to send every single quiz to them. So just be a bit judicious when it comes to that. Um, so every single session has a, as I said, has a report. Um, so the other thing we can do, we can also go into more detail, question by question analysis, how they, they did. The overview gives us a, a view like this that we, can, that we can check standards. We haven't assigned any standards. Flashcards is new, so I'm not 100% sure what that does. I'm not going to go into that now. What I would like to point out, the download option where it exports it to an Excel document. Um, Go have a look at it. My honest view is there's not a lot that I can do with that Excel document. It, there's a lot of editing that needs to happen before it becomes a useful document. So you're probably not going to use it. You, you're more likely going to use the report that is on, um, on the dashboard itself. Then the last thing we want to look at, because I, I see we are starting to run out of time now. The last thing I want to look at is classes. Now, what I've done here is I've linked my Google Classrooms um, to to this tool and it's as straightforward as going to update Google classes and then it'll show you the different classes that you have and we're not going to switch account but you could do that as well to add different classes so here uh, uh, if you really want to get your parents engaged you can have this option require students to enter a guardian's email address so that means that the minute that they join the quizzes side of things they're required to give um, the, the, the parent's email address. One thing I can warn you about is the minute you do that, learners tend to be a little bit hesitant of that. I wouldn't start with that necessarily. I would maybe start off without the parents involved immediately. However, I think from a, when we're looking at our younger learners, then it might be, a, I'm talking about my experience from, um, my, my experience working with high school learners, but I think your younger learners, you might, might be well served to get the parents involved. Um, if you don't have Google Classroom, you don't have to worry. You can still create a class um, on its own. So we will create a class. We're going to call it example classroom two. And you can assign a color to it, which doesn't really matter. And it just make it the blue class. Um, and again, it gives you the option to require students to enter Guardian's email address. I'm going to leave that off. So when we create the classroom, what they give you is they give you a link that you can send to your learners. So if you are using something like WhatsApp to communicate with your learners, you can copy that link. Um, you can copy that link and just paste it in your WhatsApp group and the learners can click on that. It'll take them through the process of signing up and joining a class. Now, this can be a little bit buggy, what I've experienced. Sometimes they first have to sign up and it'll take them to quizzes. And then they'll have to click on the link a second time once they've created their account, which then adds them to the classroom. The nice thing is the minute that they add it to the classroom, so let's say I've got this classroom as an example, um, my example classroom. If I then go back to my, from the classroom itself, there's very little that you can actually do. 
the classroom, the, this classroom screen is actually just a grouping system. So there's there's very there's not a lot you can do within this within this. However, when you go to your library, as we've as we've been using, and I go to a quiz, and I want to assign homework, then if I've got classroom set up, I can select a classroom um, to start with. Example classroom. That means that the 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 learners in this classroom will automatically get a notification that they need to go join the, the the quizzes if you can't find if they can't find it if they go to quizzes and they see but they don't see it they simply need to click on join a game and there will be a notification that you have an assignment that you need to complete that they can click on and it'll take them to the assignment um okay i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to stop there before we go again beyond the information overload because i think there's a lot of content a lot of information that i shared with you now um, regarding quizzes and the use of quizzes so if we're just going to break it down and simplify it again i always like to ha give you a basic path of what what next what should you do next um, the first thing that one can do is just simply go and create a few quizzes to just get used to the tool of how how one creates quizzes when you assign quizzes for the first time, I don't suggest going into the classes function immediately. My suggestion is first using the links that are there because the links work quite well on their own already. So if you've got, even if you have a Google Classroom, um, for the most part, when I used quizzes, I didn't necessarily use the classes function. I generally like to just share the links themselves. So I would go to assign homework, I'd go through the whole process of assigning the homework and then I would go to getting the link and I would just copy that link and share it with my learners um, in a Google Classroom or whatever tool you use to communicate. This obviously if you're on Microsoft Teams, it works 100% fine in Teams as well. You can just share the link on there. That obviously doesn't have a direct connection like we have here with Classroom, but what Google Classroom, this Google Classroom connection actually just does, it just sends that same information that same link to the learners in a different way. So that is my suggestion when you get going with it. Set up your quiz, get your link set up, and send the links to learners. Um, if you don't necessarily want to start with the homework part of things, just see if you could start with the practice links, because this is the practice link is the most dumbed-down version of it, I suppose. You can start with that, and then obviously, if you've got your learners in class, if, you've, if they have access to devices, Go, go try out the play live mode. It's a lot of fun. It really is. Uh, the learners really enjoy it, especially if you have already tried things like Kahoot in your classroom. You're looking for something a little bit different. Um, they actually, in, in the beginning, they, 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 what I've seen is they're a little bit hesitant. They feel, but they want the, the craziness of Kahoot. But then they start realizing, oh, but this is actually fun in its own way. And they start enjoying it just as much. So it's a nice way of, 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 of changing up the gamification a little bit. So, but only once you've got a bit more familiar with the system of creating, finding, editing, teleporting, all of those things, only then do I feel does it make sense to go and set up your classes. And if you're gonna set up classes, if you are going to connect to Google Classroom, if you are now in the process of kind of adopting a lot of these things, um, then it's, you don't try and do it retroactively in the sense that you're first going to go link your quizzes classroom and then get learners onto Google Classroom because then you're going to have a nightmare uh, on your hands. Once a Google Classroom is fully populated, only then should you link it. And um, so, so just be careful of that. The classes is a powerful part of it, but it is also, I suppose, in a way, the more confusing part of this. So don't start with that. Start with the simple stuff and then work your way up towards that.